Well, it's yet another interesting conversation with an author who said that uh, it's time for Bharat to take the right stand in terms of its economics and it's all based on research and we have to go back into our past. And uh, he asked a very simple question. Why is it for more than a millennia, this was the region and this was the land that everybody looked to as they envied the economic prosperity of this land, the land with golden wealth, Sone Ki Chiriya. This concept does this emerge out of uh, a practice put in place by a man who all of us knows for different, different reasons, and that's Kautilya. And this is the book, Nomics, and the author, Sriram Balasubramaniam, is with me right here. So, Sriram, namaste, and thank you very much. So, let's start with the fact that, uh, first is that for someone like Vivek Debroji to write the foreword means that there is a lot of meat in the book, and it, it derives merit. But Nomics. Where did this evolve? Uh, thanks, Anand, for providing me this opportunity. Uh, glad that you like the book. And of course, if uh, uh, thanks to Big G as well for the beautiful forward. Uh, as you mentioned, the, the, the fact that a, a, a thousand years of prosperity, and, and which we are all aware of, mm. uh, the intriguing thought was when I was working on Angus Madison, a world around historians, economic historian's data set, which illustrates the GDP data mm. um, uh, during this period. So my intuitive understanding was there had to be some sort of a, a, an economic framework uh, based, on, uh, based on which this prosperity happened, uh, something prior to common era. Mm. Uh, that's when I chanced upon the Arthashastra. Uh, and uh, I realized that very little was written about the Artha and the Arthashastra. Arthashastra. <laughs> no, we call economics in Hindi as Arthashastra. Right. That, that's the uh, term for... But we don't understand the artha behind or meaning behind Arthashastra. But why economic history? Yeah, because the, the, the fact that there was such a you know, prosperous time uh, had to be triggered by some sort of an economic framework. It mm. it's, doesn't happen by accident, was my intuitive understanding. And then when I chanced upon the text, I realized that you know, much of the discussion has been on the sort of political side, you know, the Chanakya Niti side, or the discussion has been on things like you know, self-help books mm. or, or fiction books. But where is the Artha and Arthashastra? Again, that question kept coming back to me. And that's when I sort of probed and, and uh, through uh, a very long process uh, uh, proposed a sort of an economic framework uh, for, through, for Kautilya's ideas. Mm. Um, that was challenging because you had to first understand the dense text, the Sanskritam text, uh, and, and then understand the economic slash finance of the text and then contextualize it for today's times. Mm. So it's a sort of a, a three-stage process. So, so you had to first learn Samskritam, That's right. then understand the meaning of what's written in Samskritam, right. then contextualize it to modern day uh, economics and the way things are working now and then try and draw parallels. There is a reason why this book, ladies and gentlemen, right now is the bestseller as far as economic history is concerned. It's gone into a reprint already. That's right. So yeah. congratulations on that. Thank so you. someone has got his economics right, <laughs> 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 if I may say that. But uh, good luck to you on that. But there is a lot of information, I must say. Uh, and this means that there has to be a lot of research that was done. So how many years of research has gone into uh, this book? Well, uh, about four to five years, uh, to be honest, uh, mm -hmm. because uh, the first part of what you said is right. You had to learn Sanskritam. I already had some knowledge of Sanskritam. But more important is you have to, I'm not a scholar. Mm. So you had to deal with Sanskritam scholars and engage with them, try to understand the way the text is structured, mm. uh, use techniques which we are not probably privy to, which scholars are, and then use their knowledge to sort of, you know, blend it with, the, with, with say, what I bring to the table, for example, with economics mm. and finance, and then create a framework. And that framework should be illustrated to the current audience. So that it, it's, it's a coalition of all these things. So it took about four to five years to sort of get this, you know, uh, all these three pillars right. Uh, um, and uh, eventually I'm happy that the output is, has shaped up well. But there's a lot of work behind it, you're right. So. No, and that work shows. Um, it, it's quite dense, ladies and gentlemen, but it's also easy to understand because you've also put in a lot of tables, graphs, uh, in terms of comparison of notes. But let me ask you, you're not the first person to write on Janakya. You're not the first person to uh, explore Kautilya, his thoughts, and even on the economic part. So how are you different 
from the others? Yeah, that's a fair question. I mean, uh, I didn't write it to be different. Hmm. Uh, I, I wrote it because of the curiosity I had, which I just mentioned. And I found surprisingly that no one had dealt with it. So it, it sort of, you know, fell into the, uh, you know, the jigsaw, as you call it. Uh, but I think the difference here is, you exactly mentioned, there are three types of audiences that this book tries to cater to. One is the Indic slash, you know, uh, 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 mythological audience who mm. are very keen on our culture and our, on our ancient past. Mm. Another is sort of the economic slash finance audience who are also keen on something ancient. Another is a common reader, mm. right? So the book had to cater to each of them and ensure that, you know, uh, it doesn't, it's, it's not diluted for either of them. Mm. Which means each each of these experts shouldn't feel that you know it's shot in 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 their sort of area of expertise. Mm. So that was a very thin line which I had to sort of navigate, and that's why you know it required a lot of uh, rigor, and it's it's sometimes dense. Yeah, it and, is. And and, and I, I, I had to I had to go back and read a few passages to understand uh, and to to try and actually make sense. But uh, like you said, there are it's all about Bharat but different ways of people who want to look and understand Bharat. So you have those who are into Sabhyata and Samskriti of Bharat. There are those who want to understand the uh, cultural ethos and of course the civilizational richness uh, and somewhere the economics comes in. And those who are just trying to say, hey, what is this guy saying? And is there something for me to learn with respect to principles of economics? Uh, please. Yeah, and just one point there is that, you know, there is also, you know, I have to thank my publisher for this because... You know, though I've, I have written for many publications before, there are quite a few publishers who wanted it sort of diluted a bit. Mm. But I was insistent that, you know, that the Bharati audience uh, are more than capable of handling complex content. In fact, uh, my uh, feeling was that, you know, people embrace complex content nowadays. So the more, uh, you know, uh, the feedback that I received on the book uh, is amazing. There are people who have read it twice. Yeah. Uh, the people who have reviewed it twice. And they're learning more about it. So I think the notion that, you know, readers, you know, somehow do not like complex content, I think in today's age is, is a misnomer. Hmm. I think as long as the content is, there is rigor, there's an analytical rigor, and there's a curiosity among people, there is always an audience. Yeah. More importantly, the fact, if the facts lead to a dedu deduction and you are you're driving the audience and you're at the outset, you say that you are not saying that this is right. right. You are just presenting the facts to say, it, is this possible? And can we deduce that this is the way forward? So let me ask you, this is a phenomenal uh, idiom or a phrase that you've caught, which is the sara of this book. That is dharmic capitalism. And I fell in love with this whole concept itself because you are saying that, and correct me if I'm wrong, because that's my understanding, that welfare is intrinsic to the creation of wealth. So if I were to say, traditionally India did well because the Rajas or the kings were supposed to create wealth so that nobody in the Praja, among the Praja, went hungry. So it was welfare for all. Have I understood that this is where you are coming from and this is possible? Because you are saying socialism and capitalism were woven together under dharmic capitalism. It was, yeah, please. Yeah, um, you know, in the context of Kautilya, uh, since, you know, that is what the subject is about, my view of what Kautilya thought was, uh, you know, between the state and the market, just sort of a binary uh, uh, with which it's sort of a levers that we use, you know, the state, for example, if there's uh, any movement by the state in terms of infrastructure spending, taxation, these are some levers that you use when the economy is, is evolving. Hmm. The same thing with the market, right? So Kautilya felt that uh, dharma could play a role of self-correcting both of them. Uh, and the fact that, for example, if there's corruption in the state, hmm. then the role of dharma could be an enabler to reduce the amount of corruption. The same thing with the market. So that way it sort of liberates both the state and the market, and sort of the burden in, in that sense goes on dharma, on, on dharmic values. Uh, but it also helps to sort of have a more sustainable foundation uh, to economic prosperity. So I, for example, define Kautilya's you know, classification on ethics, responsibilities, and a sort of a global approach. Hmm. Uh, because he was, you know, open to international trade. Uh, uh, as we are all aware, there's, international trade was probably uh, uh, pretty prominent during Kautilya's time. Uh, and so he had a very broad worldview uh, 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 for someone thousands of years ago. Hmm. Uh, so in that sense, so uh, what I, uh, my interpretation 
is that uh, the idea of dharmic capitalism, not that, you know, uh, it needs to be defined through the prism of capitalism, but given that some of the contours in today's times are around that uh, verbiage, uh, you know, the, the idea uh, pre basically presents dharma at the center of it. Mm. And, and that is sort of the foundation of Cotillier's sort of worldview. So, so dharma means you, you need to have a certain value system that drives your economic policies or, or that there will be a certain, uh, uh, you define dharma as duties, value system or a code which will define the economic principles on which the country will run. Yeah, so that's again a challenge, right? We define dharma in, in thousands of ways. Yes. I, mean, I mean, we have these, you know, uh, discussions at home, uh, whether it's spiritual or otherwise, right? For, for, the, for the practical purposes of, of this book, uh, if you had noticed, you know, I sort of define it into three buckets. One is on the role of ethics uh, uh, in terms of institutions, transparency in terms of uh, credible institutions and, and the role of ethics in all of this. Uh, uh, and then the other bucket is on responsibilities, societal responsibilities, environmental responsibilities, you know, the idea of uh, uh, sustainability and things mm. like that. Mm. And, and then the third is the, uh, 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 what we call is the Loka Kshema, I mean, mm. the, the broader world you know, happiness hmm. uh, and, and, and the role of, say, harmony and, and Vasudeva Kurumbakam as, as a concept. Correct. And how does that sort of have an internationalist approach? So I, these are three sort of buckets which, you know, I hmm. uh, uh, segment dharma into. And, and that's my interpretation of Kautilya. Having said that, I mean, like you mentioned, the, the main purpose of, of the book is to get this thing to be debated, right? Can you imagine that we talk so much about Kautilya, but very little about what his you know, uh, economic philosophy could be. So we could have a situation after, you know, say reading this multiple times uh, and, and uh, looking at the translations again, that we could define dharma in other ways yeah. and then have a probably a different approach or different analytical view of what Kautilya is thinking. So in that sense, it is still, you know, kindles my curiosity, I would say. True, you do. And uh, it's interesting. I've not, I'll be honest with you, I've not got up to page 237, but I stumbled upon this, ladies and gentlemen. I'm halfway through the book and I'm going to complete it soon. That's a promise, Sri Rab. But uh, this, here you've put out a table. Now this table encapsulates the key insights. Now this itself shows how much work has gone through it. But when you say the philosophy of dharmic capitalism and you define it, you say dharmic capitalism through a rule-based yet non-intrusive state Wealth creation and sustainable growth and welfare. Somewhere on the lines of what Prime Minister Modi says, minimum government, maximum governance, if, if you were to loosely put it there. But then you also turn around and say ease of trade, internal trade between states or kingdoms. So now with this no longer riyasats or kingdoms, but it's states. And export diversification along with tariff management. You talked about sustainability. So you say that a holistic approach towards sustainable development which encompasses societal, environmental and familiar responsibilities. So now you're saying that it's not going to be, it's going to be a comprehensive umbrella where every action, you will also think about the repercussions at various levels. So that's where the dharma comes in, the dharma aspect comes in. That's right. I mean, in my view, uh, what, what we had done thus far on, on Kautelya is that hmm. uh, you had looked, many, many scholars have looked at the text, uh, um, you know, uh, at, at their own sort of, you know, ha added their own perspectives. But what you need is subject matter experts looking at each of these components. Because Kautelia has a very multi-dimensional personality. Yeah. Right? He, there are 15 chapters. There are about 6,000 slokas in, in the book. So the chapters deal with law and justice. Chapters deal with, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, the economy. It deals with the state and things like that. And there are a lot of these concepts which sort of intertwine everywhere else. So the attempt really here is to sort of take that, you know, look at all these angles and then illustrate through some of the pointers that you mentioned, and then provide the thinking behind Kautilya. What we are, I think, missing thus far is, mm. the, is, is the conceptual underpinning, the thought process of Kautilya, which I attempt to extract. And that's where, you know, the idea of sustainability, because he talks yeah. a lot about societal responsibility, protecting the environment. You know, he talks about uh, the need to protect, say, forest and, and in, in those days, uh, um, and, and the need for, you know, a state which is, because often the criticism with Cordelia is that, you know, it's sort of a socialistic state, yeah. which I sort of push back in, in the book, because uh, my view is that it's a very organized state, an organized state, but it doesn't really micromanage uh, your activities. For example, there might be X, Y, Z rules and regulations in the Arthashastra, but it doesn't tell you how much 
quantity of say trade that you need to do between X and Z or, or A and B at any point of time in my view. So it's, it's, it's an organized state and another point is everything in the Arthashastra doesn't necessarily mean to be implemented. It's sort of a template. You know, and in that sense, I think Kautilya has sort of made it context agnostic. You won't find, for example, uh, mentions of uh, uh, the Mauryan kingdom yeah. or what components of the Mauryan kingdom any kingdom needs to do, right? So he sort of became uh, a, a sort of a, uh, a wanted this to be a, a context agnostic uh, 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 document. document. So in all likelihood, depending on the circumstances, he could pre choose some of these pieces that he wants to implement as policy. So I think we have to also give him that freedom of, you know, doubt uh, rather than, you know... Uh, you you repeatedly, repeatedly underline the concept of a non-intrusive state. It's rule-based, but it's non-intrusive, and that's what you expounded on. Now, uh, final question to you. How do we take this forward into the Amrit Kal? What can Bharat do to learn from Kautilya? And can we actually, in this current geopolitical situation move to a platform of dharmic capitalism or thought process because economics is driving the world to war it's driving prime ministers to resign in 45 days it's it's pushing a lot of uh, thing the underlying uh, aspect is all economics at all levels if you were to see so for bharat which is looking at its amrit kal of growth how can we get on to dharmic capitalism can we actually do it yeah that, that's a fair question right i think the 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 idea of the book is to sort of put Kautilya's ideas on the table, and then see what is applicable. I think we are sensible enough to understand that obviously there are established systems today which are you know, far more refined in terms of data and content, and, and we move ahead uh, um, a lot. But eventually, we are still human beings. And human beings and interactions based on human beings have a certain sort of you know, uh, 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 an ethos behind it, which I think that's where Kautilya's ideas could come into play. So I think what Kautilya's ideas could help us is because there's always a gap between what the policies try to implement and what the people mm. actually in, in their own cultural societal norms uh, uh, do in terms of activities. So I think this idea of uh, uh, Kautilya's ideas could sort of help to bridge the gaps. And on specific policy issues, uh, uh, you could you know, use some of his ideas uh, to further you know, ensure that there is greater efficiency of some of these policies so that people adapt it more. Uh, so I think it's it's up to debate. I mean, the last chapter, for example, penultimate mm. chapter, I talk about what are some of the future issues. Right. And, and I myself ask questions because I myself, you know, I'm still contemplating on what Kautilya would have thought. So I think this is a good template for people to think about and uh, I'm pretty sure it will be useful for many scholars to sort of, uh, and policymakers to look at it in the future. Well, absolutely. And uh, I think for, for all of us to think about a little more and know a little more in terms of civilizationally understand that if your fundamentals economically are good, then you have a nation that will prosper. So you've got to get that basis right. And might is what is respected. And it's purely economic heft. And can we do it with an element of dharma? Well, that's what this book talks about. So congratulations on that, Sriram. Thank you very much.